we're glad to have you here. Um, I guess I'll, we're just a couple of minutes before official start, so let me, um, let me do a few housekeeping things here just sure. to get us going. Um, and, um, okay, so a few announcements about the afternoon. The Astro Imaging Contest should now be live for people to, to vote. Um, I will, once the talk starts, I will put the link to the Astro Imaging Contest in the chat so people can jump right out of that or they could go to the TriStar webpage and, and follow the link there. The instructions are there about um, what you should do. Um, so look over the images and um, uh, pick your favorites. And the announcement um, of, about the winners will, will come at the end of our last talk this afternoon. Our, um, so the afternoon schedule is this talk at one o'clock, um, which will wrap up with, you know, I'm sure that you'll have questions at the end about the presentation itself, but then we'll transition during the Q&A to uh, an open discussion about um, the world of sky and telescope. We have the observing editor here today. She's already um, chimed in in one of the morning talks to help us out uh, with some resources that the magazine and the website provide. Um, but if you um, have questions ab about the magazine, um, about how it works, about what her job is, um, anything related to that, um, we'll just um, spend a little time talking about that because Sky and Tell, um, so many of us recognize is is an integral part of amateur astronomy and has been for um, many decades. And so I, I know a lot of people here appreciate the magazine and what you do there. And so this should be fun. But first, you're going to tell us about um, radio astronomy. So a couple of other announcements before we do that. Um, if I mentioned this earlier, but if you are associated with another club and you have an event coming up that you want your colleagues here to know about, just um, um, type something in the chat about it, the date, the, the link. Um, I know the Bob Fest event is coming up in a couple of weeks, the Catawba Valley people are doing, um, and uh, there are other regional meetings around. So if you have info on any of those, put them in the chat so that people will know about them. And um, I will mention again that on April 1st, we have a um, the Stellar Society lecture, which will be a talk about Venus by Paul Byrne. It will be a virtual event, 7 o'clock Friday evening, um, April 1st. And if you go to the Klein Observatory website um, and find the Stellar Society lecture page there, there will be more information about that talk coming. We, we basically have our speaker. We don't have the details about the specifics of the talk yet. Um, so let's go ahead and, and get things started with our afternoon speaker. Um, we're really excited to have Diana Hanakainen here from Sky and Telescope magazine. She um, has her degrees in physics from the University of Edinburgh, and um, then she went to the University of Helsinki, and um, then got her doctorate uh, from University of Sydney in Australia. Her doctoral thesis was multi-wavelength observations of microquasars, and that, that led her into a lot of radio astronomy. Um, but in 2017, she came to Sky and Tell, where she's the uh, observing editor, and she'll tell us later about what she does for that. But right now, she's going to take us through a tour of the history of radio astronomy and all the exciting things about it. So let's turn things over to Diana. Uh, thank, thank you so, you so much, much Tom. Tom. So, so, um, um, the first, the first thing, thing I will do is try and get my cat to calm down. She'll be uh, I will share my screen and then start the presentation, right? Share screen and start the presentation. Okay. Can everybody see the slides? Not yet. Not yet. I see the presentation on my screen. Okay. 
and so in teams you would use the share button which is the one that looks like a, um, a rectangle with the up arrow i have done that okay let me try again it says Your video is highlighted for everyone in the meeting is what it says now. Okay, share content screen. Okay. Is yep. that and better? There, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. And um, as, uh, as, as Tom suggested or mentioned, I would love to share with you a little bit about uh, radio astronomy, the history of radio astronomy, and uh, where we are today. So uh, again, as Tom mentioned, uh, for my PhD, I, I, I researched microquasars. And microquasars are these amazing objects, uh, binary stars, where you have a Roche lobe filling regular star feeding matter onto a compact object. In my case, they were black holes, and often you would see they, they would eject matter in the form of these um, uh, ultra relativistic jets. And the accretion disk around the black hole radiates in X rays and the jets in the radio. So I focused on observing these objects in X ray and, uh, and the radio. And as uh, you might guess from my name, uh, I am of uh, Finnish extraction. My father's from Finland, and but I didn't grow up in Finland. So after I finished my undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland, I thought I would go to Finland to um, uh, uh, explore my roots uh, while I was also uh, studying for my PhD. The only thing is Finland's up in the north and it's very far north. And so while I was there, uh, both studying and then researching, this is the, the view from my office for much of the year. Well, not much of the year, but let's say most of the winter, the snow would come just right up to the, um, almost at the top of the windows. But I was really lucky to have forged a collaboration with people at the University of Sydney. Australia has a very long tradition in radio astronomy, as I will touch on uh, a little bit later on. But I was super lucky because, for example, January, this is what the view from my office window was, and this was the view from my digs just a few days later when I, when I, was, uh, when I flew down there. And while I was there, I had the remarkable opportunity to really get up close to some of the radio facilities that they have in Australia. And while there, um, uh, I, I spoke with uh, several of the people who'd been involved in the history of uh, radio astronomy in Australia, and somebody recommended that I read the book by John Krauss, uh, called uh, Big Ear. And it was then that I, I just got so excited at the um, at, at, at how radio astronomy developed, at the engineering that went into it, at the technology that went into it. But I never, you know, when I started, when I was in research and, and, I, and I really dove into the research for my PhD, I just sort of drifted away from all that and I just focused on the science of the objects that I was studying. But then after I joined Sky and Telescope in uh, August 2020, I had the great opportunity to write this article for, uh, Sky, for, for the August issue. And I was going to write about radio astronomy, the emission processes, the, um, the, the objects, the celestial objects that we observe in the radio and so on. But then I thought, you know what? I'd like to go back and, and, and really explore the, the roots of, of how this amazing uh, discipline came into being. So I'm not an engineer, engineer by any means. And so, uh, but, but this was just curiosity on my part to sort of dig into some of this. And also having had the amazing opportunity to be up close and personal with some of these radio telescopes, it was just, it was, I just wanted to know a little bit more about them. So just a little reminder, we are all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum. We all uh, see uh, the world around us in the visible. And at the shorter end of the visible, so at the blue end, indigo end, we, as we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, we go from the ultraviolet through the X-rays to the gamma rays. And at the longer end of the visible here at the red end, we go from the infrared to progressively longer wavelengths through the microwave until we hit the radio. That are the longest waves that we know um, of. And uh, radio waves, uh, we, we classify radio waves as from a couple of centimeters to kilometers in length. Most radio astronomers will talk in gigahertz, in hertz, so megahertz and gigahertz. Uh, but, uh, but we talk about radio waves, wavelengths, and so on, and, 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 and those are often interchangeable. 
And this is a little equation that is, oh, you see, because I have this little window here. That's why I didn't see it. Let me move that up there. Um, maybe I can even get, oh, now I don't know where that went. It doesn't matter. So uh, this is a little equation that I will return to every now and then, and it, it expresses um, angular resolution, and that is uh, the smallest detail that we can observe or that we can uh, measure is governed by the uh, length of the wavelength and the diameter of the detector. So the longer the wavelength, the larger the detector has to be so that we can achieve smaller scales of resolution. So we don't need to go further into that. But just bear that in mind because we're all we're talking about wavelengths throughout this. Now I'm going to step back. Oh, uh, one more thing about radio waves is uh, they actually penetrate the atmosphere right down to um, uh, ground level. Uh, X-rays and gamma rays, we need to lob satellites up above the atmosphere to be able to detect any of them. Visible is uh, heavily distorted by the atmosphere, all the moisture in the atmosphere and, and other atmospheric disturbances. I infrared, there are a couple of windows, but for the most part, uh, we prefer to be high up on mountains This and, and um, uh, preferably in space, like the James Webb Space Telescope is now safely at L2. But radio waves come right down, for the most part, come right down to uh, to ground level. Uh, there is, at, at a certain length, uh, after a certain wavelength, they, um, they're they uh, repelled by the ionosphere, but for the most part, they come down to uh, ground level, which is actually very handy. So if we go back, step back to uh, the early uh, history of, well, not the early history of astronomy, but let's step back to the um, uh, before the 1930s. Our universe, what we knew of our universe was brought to us through, largely through the visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There was a little bit of dabbling in the late 1800s in, um, in infrared, but for the most part, our universe was visual. And until the 1900s, we knew about the planets, we knew about stars, we knew about star clusters, we knew about nebulae. Um, a lot of uh, progress had been made, a lot of advances had been made in people that were systematically cataloging the objects that uh, people had been observing, that astronomers had been observing. We are all familiar with the Messier catalog, the NGC catalog. So they listed a variety of objects and they tried to systematically uh, catalog these objects, but our universe was still very local. Uh, we still did not know really the nature of the Milky Way and what was beyond it. But then in the 1910s, Vesto Slifer started observing redshift to spectral lines from galaxies. We started getting an inkling that there was a universe out there that we weren't really familiar with. And of course, the big discoveries by Hubble and Humison when they discovered the redshift, redshift distance correlation of uh, the nebulae or the galaxies uh, really told us that what we had been observing until now is uh, very, very, very local to us. And so for the most part, um, telescopes were these uh, lovely, uh, lovely uh, refractors. You have a couple of lenses here and there. You have a couple of uh, some of them, you know, in, in the reflectors, you have mirrors that that uh, reflect the light back up into a uh, detector or eyepiece. And all of the recording we did, well, before photographic plates, it was all sketching. It was all by hand. It was all sort of pencil and paper sketching. And then we got photographic plates and we were able to uh, to record things for a little bit longer. But that's the universe we knew uh, around the 1930s. And then uh, big advances were being made in the field of uh, radio communications and the telephone had been invented and people were calling one another and and um, uh, Bell uh, Telephone Laboratories uh, realized uh, that there was a lot of this sporadic static that was interfering with their radio communications and with their with telephone calls and all of that. So he asked this young uh, physicist and engineer by the name of Carl Jansky to start investigating uh, how could they address uh, the static and other interferences to try and make radio communication smoother. And so Jansky being the inventive type that he was, he put together this amazing contraption. Basically, he built a glorified antenna out of brass piping and timber. And uh, it was uh, 30 meters across and about six meters high. So there's Jansky in the field right by his contraption. And he mounted it onto the wheels of a Model T Ford so that he could rotate it. And that was, I mean, absolutely brilliant because like this, he was he was basically doing sweeps of the sky. 
and it rotated fully every 20 minutes. And no surprise there, it earned the, the honorable nickname of Jansky's merry-go-round. And the interference that Jansky was able to identify were local thunderstorms and distant thunderstorms. And those he was able, you know, he knew the direction they were coming in, he could see them localized. He said, okay, that static comes from that thunderstorm. That hiss comes from that uh, thunderstorm. But he, he detected a third type of interference that he noted as a steady hiss type of static of unknown origin. So he proceeded to investigate it. And what he did was, Right by his contraption, he had this little shed that he built and he very simply with, with a sort of mechanical pencil and log thing, he, um, he recorded the, uh, uh, the, the radio signals that he was getting in his con uh, via his contraption. And he wrote a paper in 1933 that pu he published in Popular Astronomy in 1933 uh, and the title was The Electrical Phenomena That Apparently Are of Interstellar Origin. And what he noticed was, here we have a graph of time on the x-axis that increases on the x-axis, and then we have intensity. And here at the top, um, he plotted the uh, direction of the signal. And he noticed that, okay, so remember that his contraption rotated every 20 minutes, but every 20 minutes, he noticed that there was a, 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 a definite increase in, in the intensity. And uh, so he started to investigate that further, and he plotted these uh, peaks uh, throughout the year, and he noticed that there was a drift in the peak throughout the year. Here we have the time of day. It wasn't at the same time of day every day. Uh, it was completely independent of time of day. So initially he thought that it might have been the sun, but because of this drift in the peaks throughout the year, the azimuth was changing uh, direction as we went through uh, all, all of the, these are the months, that's January, February, March, April. So the peak kept shifting. And what he realized was that at the end of the sidereal year, the curve was back at its initial position. So he concluded that this uh, intensity, this peak of intensity was not correlated with the 24 hour period of the sun, but rather with the 23 hour, 56 minute uh, time scale of the sidereal uh, 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 day. And so that got him thinking. And he noticed that uh, uh, the, he quote, he, uh, this is a direct quote from his paper, to one familiar with the manner in which the heavenly bodies change their position hourly and daily, these facts indicate that the direction of arrival is fixed in space. So it was not correlated with any motion of, of the sun during, during, you know, the daytime, uh, uh, um, as it traversed the sky or anything else. It was a fixed position from which he was getting this very strong signal. And the signal was strongest in the direction of the galactic plane and, and its right ascension was around 18 hours, uh, which is somewhere in Sagittarius. And this coincides with the center of the Milky Way. And of course, now we know that at the center of the Milky Way, we have our own supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, but at the time they didn't know of it. So uh, this discovery caused some flutters and it was publicized and the New York Times wrote about it on May 5th, 1933, new radio waves traced to the center of the Milky Way and everybody got very excited. But that excitement did not last very long because by the time there was a conference dedicated to um, uh, an, uh, an astronomy conference in 1935, barely two dozen people stayed behind to listen to Jansky's talk. So whatever other talks were going on at that conference, you know, there were hundreds of people attending. By the time Jansky got up to talk, you know, barely two dozen people stayed behind. However, uh, we do uh, honor uh, Jansky and all of his efforts in the fact that we have named the unit for the flux density we uh, call the Jansky uh, in his honor. There were other intrepid pioneers during those uh, early days of radio astronomy and boy I'm envious of them. I, they, it looks like they have so much fun. Uh, John Krauss who was the uh, author of uh, Big Year and who was the guy who, who was behind um, yeah, uh, the construction of the telescope there at Ohio uh, State University the big ear, in fact, he and his PhD student, they, they'd ride around in this old Studebaker and all they had was this aluminum, three meter aluminum rod poking out uh, top. And they just ride around and and they were stopped by the police a couple of times. And um, uh, Krauss, I think was the one 
driving and his student was the one with the detector. I can't remember which way around, but anyway, they had to keep bailing one another out when, when, whenever the police stopped them. And then there were also these funny contraptions where this is basically a um, nearly 100 meters of wire that was just folded, folded uh, uh, over some field. And, um, and people were experimenting with all these different ways of capturing these cosmic radio waves radio waves in general and cosmic radio waves. But the next big step in radio astronomy was uh, Grota Raber. He was an electrical engineer and an amateur radio operator. And he was the first one to think of the idea of constructing a parabolic dish. And he built one in his backyard. It was uh, nine meters across. And amazingly, this was towards the end of the um, uh, 30s, 1930s, he was only the, only the second person after Jansky to make radio astronomical uh, measurements and record them and do something with them. And uh, because of the disruption of World War II, he was the only active radio astronomer from 1937 until after, uh, after the war, after peace return. So his uh, big um, contributions to radio astronomy was he mapped uh, the radio sky and he was able to identify certain areas where uh, where there were concentrations of radio emission, uh, Cassiopeia, Cygnus, and Galactic, Galactic Center. And we all recognize nowadays that uh, the source of the radio emission in Cygnus is uh, the galaxy Cygnus A, Cassiopeia is the supernova remnant, and the Galactic Center, of course, is our supermassive black hole. At the time, here you can see uh, the um, uh, latitude, galactic latitude and longitude, and you can see that they're not very well localized, but it was definitely a start. This was the 19, end of the 1930s with a single parabolic radio dish in his backyard. So as I intimated, World War II interrupted the progress of radio astronomy, but one very important thing happened during, radio, uh, during World War II, and that was the development of radar. Radar technology just, just developed in, um, and improved in leaps and bounds, and all nations were, were involved in the development of radar. Uh, the British, the Americans, the Australians, all over the globe, and uh, radar came in all uh, these radio dishes and antennae came in um, all different shapes and sizes and used all kinds of different uh, technology. So for the most part, radio astronomy was on hiatus and as well, much of activity around the globe during World War II. But there was one scientist, uh, the British physicist, uh, James Stanley Hay. He had been tasked with monitoring the Germans radar jamming activities. And he was operating there on the cliffs of Dover with, uh, with, with, uh, with his instrumentation and everything. And um, on a specific date, there, there it is, February 27, 28, 1942, there was such a uh, 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 interference of such intensity that all radar operation was made completely impossible. And it was uh, Hay himself, he realized that the direction of this interference, so contrary to Jansky, who wasn't finding a correlation with uh, the, the, the sun, Hay did find. He, he concluded that this uh, interference that was making radar operation impossible originated in the sun. And uh, he followed up with some uh, observatories around the world. And uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory informed him that, in fact, there was an active sunspot system was transiting the disk just as he was making these measurements. And the um, uh, observatory at the Cape of Good Hope uh, furnished him with, uh, with this image to show that this is indeed what, what he had detected. So we're going to hop down to Australia now. We're at the end of World War II. Peace of some description is um, reigning over the globe and there are all these disused radar antennas now. And they're all over the place. So a couple of people from the University of Sydney, including, uh, no, not the University of Sydney, they were uh, with, the, um, with the CSIRO, specifically the um, uh, research, uh, research um, conglomerate of, uh, not conglomerate, uh, research institute in Australia. You had Ruby Payne Scott, Alec Little, and Chris Christensen. What they did was they, uh, they used one of these uh, disused radar antennae, antennae that was on uh, the top of a cliff near Sydney, Australia. And they started making some observations and they realized that uh, uh, what, if they observed the sun, they would get a direct ray, ray from the sun would hit their antenna 
and they would also get a reflected ray from the sun. It would hit the surface of the sea, ocean, sea, Tasman Sea, and then it would reflect back into the antenna, effectively giving them a baseline or a telescope uh, that is about 200 meters in length, because this is the projected image of the incoming ray that is reflected. But uh, by combining these, they had an effective baseline of like 200 meters. On top of that, that allowed them to make spatial observations. And so in a series of remarkable observations uh, at the end of 1945, they were able to follow some sunspots on the disk of the sun, surface of the sun. They were taken at different dates and they were able to actually localize where these sunspots were on the, the surface of the sun. And so this would be the birth of interferometry that I will talk about in uh, shortly. So we have moved from Jansky's merry-go-round contraption thingy to Grota Raver's nine meter parabolic dish in his backyard to the using disused uh, radars. And uh, then throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, people started building bigger and bigger radio dishes. Because remember uh, the equation, uh, theta equals lambda over D. If we want to capture and uh, these long radio wavelengths and make use of them, we need to be able to uh, not only capture them, but also have data at a certain resolution so that it is useful to us. So we want to build big area collecting devices. So we can build, you know, radio dishes. Here's the famous Green Bank 300 foot uh, radio dish, Green Bank, Virginia, um, West Virginia. West Virginia. And uh, so the, there's this uh, remarkable 300-foot um, dish. But as you can imagine, once you start building bigger and bigger objects, bigger and bigger um, things, um, structures, you, you start to encounter problems. You know, number one, physics, gravity. We live on Earth with 1G. Gravity is always going to be a problem. And then also things like weather. High winds are very detrimental to these big, unwieldy, and quite delicate structures in the end. So uh, what happened was, this picture was taken November 14, 90, 1988, and sadly, November 15th, uh, the, the whole thing collapsed. And uh, it was a very sad moment. But these things happen with these huge, so there is a limit to our technology to how big we can build these dishes. But all is good. The 300, uh, uh, 300 foot dish was, uh, was rebuilt. It's now the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank radio telescope and it's still operating today even though there were some questions a couple of years back about 10 years back whether it could continue but as far as I understand it is happily functioning there so they rebuilt it but um, there's another 300 foot radio telescope in Effelsberg Germany but that is about the biggest that we can make a single dish uh, radio telescope as far as I understand that's fully steerable so you see this is on a mount and we can steer we can move this around to point in the sky uh, to to where we want in the sky to uh, to our objects of interest so then of course um, I didn't want to go to Arecibo because of course that's another sad story but there are a couple of uh, radio radio uh, dishes that are that were are and were built into these natural bowls in in the earth one of them was Arecibo in Puerto Rico and the other is the fast radio telescope in China but so fully steerable we're kind of limited to the approximately 300 foot so um, just to show you the different types of telescopes that uh, radio telescopes that that exist in the world um, and the uh, I just wanted to pay a little bit of tribute to the Australians. Uh, the uh, Mills Cross was one of the earlier telescopes, and it was basically just a bunch of wires, uh, just two antennae that are um, uh, shaped in, in, in a cross, and that morphed into the Malanglo Observatory Synthesis Telescope, which is basically a cylindrical paraboloid. It's about a kilometer long, and um, and and these are telescopes. You cannot steer them. The cylindrical paraboloids, you can steer a little bit. You can sort of you can you can tilt them a little bit so that they can point uh, to where you want. But you're limited to the rotation of the Earth. So you have to wait. If you're if you're interested in observing something, you have to uh, wait for the for the Earth to rotate, and um, and and you follow your source as it rotates, and you can um, 
uh, get your observations that way. Um, I uh, then we have the uh, single dish. Uh, telescopes as well as as we've already covered some and and the great thing about one of the positive things about um, uh, radio waves you know being so long is that you can actually build the the dish out of like wire mesh because the wavelengths are so long the little holes here they don't really see the little holes that are are there in the dish they just they just sort of uh, reflect right off into the um, into the detector mount up here all right so Back to that uh, pesky little equation of angular resolution. So lambda is wavelength. The longer the wavelength, uh, the larger the diameter of your collecting device needs to be so that you can have usable and useful uh, resolutions to interpret your data. So how do we get to something bigger? Like if we can't build larger than let's say about 300 feet, how can we get a telescope how can we how can we inc increase our collecting area well one way to do that is by linking several of these dishes together in that technique called interferometry that ruby payne scott and her colleagues sort of invented in um in 1946 there with that little radar off the cliff uh, off the cliff uh, north of sydney and I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, very large array uh, near Socorro, New Mexico. This is an amazing, amazing instrument. It is basically 27 uh, dishes of 25 meters diameter each. And they are mounted on train tracks, like tracks here, like, uh, yes, uh, rail tracks, and in this Y pattern. And every four months or so, they change the configuration. There are four main configurations that are called A, B, C, and D. And they can go from a very compact 0.6 miles in uh, diameter right out to about 22 miles in diameter, 36 kilometers, when they're stretched at their, um, at their most uh, stretched. And why do we want four different types of configuration. Why don't we just leave the dishes where they are and just do our observations? Well, each one of these contribu uh, each one of these contri okay, first let me let me let me go back to moving these dishes on the rails. I just thought this was really cool. They have these transporters and each one of these transporters they you mount a dish onto this transporter and then the transporter uh, moves it uh, back and forth along the trail tracks and then um, they change configurations that way. So going back to my question, uh, why would you want to explore? Why would you want to use, have these four different con configurations um, uh, uh, to, why would you want to reset the VLA into these four different types of configurations when each time you move them apart, you have to get the transporters on. It's a big operation. It's quite a long operation. Well, the reason is that each one of these configurations probes a different uh, scale of the cosmic source that you are trying to observe. So here we have in uh, diagram diagrammatic form, the four main configurations of the VLA. We'll start with D, which is the most compact. So that's um, when it's 0.6 uh, miles across. And with the most compact configuration, we can uh, observe the larger structures of a cosmic object. Here we're looking at the radio galaxy Hercules A. And we have the elliptical galaxy. It's a giant elliptical that's right here in the middle. And we don't see it uh, necessarily in um, in this uh, in this image, but so with the VLA in the D configuration, we are probing the big outer lobes of the radio emission that's associated with this galaxy. We'll move up in configuration size, so we're going to three kilometers. You start to see the radio galaxy, and you start to see structure to these radio lobes. You're seeing the <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the, the, the jets, the collimated jets, and uh, what the lobes that these collimated jets uh, balloon into when they hit the intergalactic medium. As we go up in configuration, we're now at the 11 kilometer configuration, the B configuration. We are probing the sort of the, the, the thinner parts of the jet and we're starting to see a lot more detail in uh, the, the, the jets. 
and the galaxy is still a nice little pinpoint there. And then we go to the largest configuration, the 36 kilometer uh, A configuration, and we can see we're really starting to pick out the fine detail inside these jets. So the whole point behind this is that each one of these configurations gives us a piece of information about this cosmic source that we're observing, and we can piece them all together and come up with this beautiful, beautiful image that tells us you know, not just how beautiful our universe is and all the objects in them, but it tells us about the physics of how these um, objects uh, operate, like what's what's going on in these objects. And so that is why we go to all the trouble to change the configurations of the VLA and so on, is to probe the different scales. Now, interferometry, as you can imagine, is quite complicated. If, um, if, if just single dish radio astronomy is one thing with all its detectors and so on, as soon as you start to combine the dishes together to create this one single uh, large telescope, uh, you have to combine all the signals because each one of these dishes is getting its own signal and you have to combine these signals together to get a coherent picture of the cosmic source that you're observing. And even when you just combine two uh, antennae together, uh, that in itself is a really complicated process. You have to correlate these um, uh, these signals. You have the, the phase difference. So you have a cosmic uh, radio signal that is hitting um, your detectors. Uh, one end of the, the wave front will hit a detector before the other one. And so you have to have perfect timing. You have to, uh, you have, to have very accurate timing and understand how to correlate these signals together to get that full signal from the two antennae together. So the two antennae like this function as a single telescope that of this diameter. So when you start to combine more, the more dishes you combine, the more complicated it gets. And in fact, this is the back end of the correlator of the Atacama um, millimeter array telescope that is uh, up there in uh, the Andes at 5,000 meters in the Andes. Here's a picture of it. It is a European Southern Observatory uh, venture and they have uh, some 50 dishes, I think. And so this is the sort of business that goes on at the back end when you're trying to combine the signals of 20-something uh, or 50-something radio dishes all together. It's messy business, but well worth it once we start seeing all those images. So, but why stop at one country? So the um, ALMA is up here in the Andes. It's just on a plateau in the Andes. We don't need to stop at one country. And in fact, there are several global endeavors that have linked radio telescopes across the globe. We have the very long baseline array here in the United States that stretches from uh, the Virgin Islands right out to Hawaii and across you know, several radio telescopes uh, across the continental uh, US with the VLA here. And then uh, the European has their own VLBI network and uh, there's the East Asian VLBI network. So each one of these combines these uh, radio dishes together to form one big continent-wide radio telescope. So in effect, with the VLBA, each one of these individual antennae, I, what is it, 25 meters across, I believe, I might be wrong, 25, 12 meters or 25 meters is each one of these dishes. But so each one of these dishes together, when you put them, when you use them as one instrument, effectively the baseline stretches from Hawaii to the Virgin Islands, same across Europe, same across Asia. So that is giving us that big D at the bottom of our equation. That means that we can probe uh, smaller and smaller scales and get more and more information on the physics of these cosmic sources. Uh, I, you must all know about the Event Horizon Telescope, which is uh, in a couple of years back, issued this uh, incredible image of the black hole in um, M87. And so the Event Horizon Telescope employed telescopes, uh, radio dishes from Europe into South America, up into the US and over across into Hawaii. And uh, so each, as the Earth rotated, each time two telescopes, two of these dishes saw M87 at the same time, they could combine the signals of those and then slowly build up this, um, uh, this map, this map uh, of, of, of the radio signals that ultimately then gave us the, uh, the, the image of, the so-called image, it's a radio constructed image of, uh, of M87.
so this is where we are today. We have we've gone from Jansky's merry-go-round uh, through Grota Raber's backyard right up to global-sized radio telescopes. And we have learned so much of the universe through these. We have learned about the cosmic microwave background that is the signal that is a sort of hiss from, from the Big Bang. We know that the sun is a radio source and we can trace uh, uh, the origin of the radio emission on the sun. Um, we know that pulsars are, 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 are radio emitters. In fact, they were discovered by Jocelyn Bell Burnell with the, uh, with, with the radio telescope in, um, in the UK. And uh, quasars, of course, with their phenomenal relativistic jets and microquasars, my field, with their smaller jets. Um, and uh, planets, planets are radio emitters, the Milky Way. And so each one of these, you know, there, there's different emission processes, different radiation, radiative processes, and that is a whole talk in itself. But the thing is, we are exploring the radio universe using these dishes, using the, the, the what's it called, the, um, uh, the diameter of the globe, uh, with these amazing arrays, with the cylindrical paraboloids, they're still working. The Malunglo Observatory, Observatory Synthesis Telescope is still producing amazing data. So where do we go from here? Well, uh, there are several very ambitious projects in the making. One of them is the Square Kilometer Array that will link thousands of telescopes across two continents, South Africa and Australia. And the VLA is in the process of being refurbished. There's the next generation VLA that will consist of uh, 244 dishes. Currently, it's 27. That's going to be 244 dishes on a baseline that will be 200 times longer than it is now. And um, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope uh, uh, team, they're looking at uh, expanding their endeavor. And they are in the process of observing other targets. Uh, but so how far can we go? So we don't even need to stop at Earth. There have been a couple of space VLBI experiments already, and uh, that involves having a couple of radio dishes on Earth and lobbing a radio antenna into space. The, um, the Japanese uh, space agency had uh, one very lovelyly called VSOP for all you cognac drinkers out there. It was a VLBI space observatory program, and the Russians had one Spectre, uh, called Spectre R. Uh, they are both defunct now, but they produced uh, quite a lot of data. But it, they were quite fiddly, these, these uh, experiments. But they, they, they give us ideas that maybe we can, we can go with this. And in fact, the Event Horizon Telescope at one point was even thinking of lobbing an antenna into Earth orbit or possibly placing one on the moon. I haven't followed up on what their plans are at the moment, but that was in the making at some point. And hey, we can even go to the moon. There are plans for a lunar crater radio telescope and uh, to go on the far side of the moon. And that is going to be amazing. It's just going to be a wire mesh suspended over a one kilometer wide crater. And that's going to be great because uh, that, um, uh, first of all, uh, it's going to be here on the far side of the moon. Here's the Earth. Uh, we are going to eliminate all of the radio interference, the radio noise, you know, from Earth. And also by being in a, uh, being outside of Earth's atmosphere, being on the surface of the moon, we will be able to access these longest wavelength radio waves that we can't now on Earth because our, our ionosphere does not let us access them. So that's an exciting project to keep your eyes on. And I'm about to conclude now, but I want to conclude with two slides. One of them is, uh, there's a very active and vibrant amateur radio community. I am not very familiar yet with the amateur radio community, and I cannot wait to get to know the amateur radio community. So if any of you are amateur radio astronomers, please get in touch with me, because I would love to know more about it. There's uh, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers have their own web page and they have annual conferences. And, um, and from what I've understood, so this is a regular sort of like amateur size radio dish. Uh, but apparently, you know, now that we are using different ways of getting our TV and so on, 
a lot of satellite TV satellite dishes are being disused, and people are actually using these radios, these um, TV uh, antennae, these TV satellite dishes to do radio astronomy. I think that's a fantastic way of recycling uh, all of these this, this equipment. So um, if you're interested in radio astronomy as as an idea, uh, do look into this. And if you are an amateur radio astronomy, please astronomer, please get in touch with me. And I want to finish up by saying that I know that there is a um, person probably in the audience right now who has contributed muchly to um, disseminating the uh, uh, knowledge of uh, radio astronomy and other fields of astronomy. And that is Don Klein through the PERI, the Pisgah Astronomical Research Institute, which I understand is down the road from you. And, um, and so uh, from what I gathered, uh, he and uh, he, there was this um, disused or uh, defunct satellite tracking station there in the Pisgah National Forest. And uh, uh, Don went in and um, uh, scooped it up and, and, and has refurbished it and has made, has transformed it into a vibrant outreach and education center. And I don't, I will not talk more about this, but I just wanted to uh, take my hat off to say thank you for doing this for not just radio astronomy, but for um, ast astronomical outreach and education and so on. And I really want to hear more about all the endeavors that you're doing there. And so with this, I want to conclude by saying thank you very much. This is not my video. This is from the Australia Telescope Compact Array but I witnessed many such things. When you're down in Australia, you've got wildlife all over the place. And while you are there observing the universe, a kangaroo can come and just hop by and remind you that our universe is splendid on so many levels. So I want to thank you very much for all of this. And, and, and the cool thing also is that um, so many radio dishes, they are just so spectacular that they have been used in uh, lots of films. Of course, contact, it's uh, the whole thing was about uh, the VLA and, and radio astronomy, but and so the dish is the one in Australia, but it also appeared randomly in some James Bonds and so on. So anyway, thank you very much. And um, I'm eager to hear what questions you may have. I may not be able to answer them, but they will give me food for thought. And now I'm trying to get out of my talk. There we go. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Diana. So <laughs> So let's um, see what we can do with some questions here. Um, so we have one, given the large number of radio telescopes presently spread across the face of the earth, would it make any sense to rebuild Arecibo? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. I do know that there has been uh, some talk. Um, I know that there are advantages to having these radio, uh, these these dishes that are built into bowls in the earth, these natural uh, bowls in the earth, and I know that there is talk of rebuilding. Uh, I think the, it's it's a good question. I do not know the actual status at the moment, but um, I think the advantage with having a, first of all, the 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 fact that by building it into one of these natural bowls is that you can make it much bigger than just the 300 feet or whatever that a fully steerable dish would have. Uh, so I, I, I think probably the main advantage is that you get a bigger aperture and a bigger, uh, but you can control your experiment uh, in, in more real time. The, the, the thing is that these radio dishes and these collaborations are phenomenal and they're fantastic, but it is logistically a nightmare trying to get all these different because each one of these institutes for example with the event horizon telescope each one of these institutes that's involved with the endeavor they have their own telescope for their own research and so they all have to get together and um uh, and, and and decide that okay now we don't have something okay now, now we have to dedicate our telescope time to this one project and forget you know even if there's a target of opportunity happen they have to they have to ignore that and they have to just uh, focus their attention on that one project so logistically trying to gather all these telescopes together is 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 very difficult in the end you do get these amazing results but so the advantage with having a large single dish to yourself is that you can 
you can dedicate your own time. You, you can, you can um, uh, uh, decide in your own time what research you want to do. Um, you said that Raber was the only radio astronomer from the late 30s through World War II. Was he publishing anything? Was he sharing his work with people? Did people really know that he was doing radio astronomy then? I think he was publishing. I'd have to look that up. Um, I know Jansky published that. He only Jansky himself only published about three papers. People just weren't interested for many reasons. So people weren't interested because there was a Great Depression going on. Uh, there was, yes, the onset of World War II and all of that. So um, I don't even know what the how functioning um, journals were during those years. But there was not much interest. I mean, just it, it was just exemplified by the fact that nobody hung out for Jansky's talk, even though the New York Times had published headline news about cosmic radio waves. So it really took the, the development of radar technology during World War II also sparked people's interest because suddenly people started to understand. Um, and so you mentioned all of those those um, radio stations were essentially now not being used. Um, how how quickly did a, did radio astronomers even develop and sort of flood into fill fill that void? Were people thinking about that from work they did in support of the war, maybe, and and then realize I can do astronomy with this? Um, how did that transition? It exploded. It really exploded. All of a sudden, when they realized that there were all these um, unused uh, radar antennae and so on, people really started whenever, wherever they could, uh, like the like the group in Sydney, they flocked to them and tried. And radio astronomy really exploded in several countries. Australia, the Netherlands, and the UK were basically the places where uh, it, it, it just suddenly flourished. And so it was it was it was pretty quick. Um, you mentioned with VLA the um, obviously you don't want to have to get out those rail cars every day and move things around. So they're in did you say four months per I think configuration? Seven, yes. Um, so the calls for proposals to use it, I guess, are built around configurations for each cycle. Very much so. And so if you wanted to study something with several different configurations, you're essentially talking about several years of work. And then there's also, seems like there would be a complication for um, just the timing through the year that maybe when you had something in one cycle, your object was well placed, um, but then yeah. another cycle comes and it's behind the sun. You absolutely, you got it. Yeah, so it it does present m many logistical issues for people who want to conduct larger uh, research projects. And uh, of course, the one positive thing about radio astronomy is you can do it during the daytime. Yeah. So that is something uh, that 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 we we actually have 24 hours that we can assign observing proposals as compared to uh, visual astronomers. But you're absolutely right. So some of these some of some of these radio pro they they are long term. I mean, if you want to like the Hercules A thing, I don't know how long it took, but they had to get uh, data from all of those configurations and they're not snapshots. It's not sort of like boom, boom, boom. And you've got you know, you've got to it, it takes time to get all of that going and get and, and, and collect all of that. So, yeah, it's it, it's and that is why radio astronomers are still trying to figure the whole field out. It is it is complex. A couple here from Gary, energy of a Jansky unit versus optical photometry energy. <laughs> I don't know. I have to get my conversion book. <laughs> okay, maybe so I can look that up and type it in. Yeah, and, um, please. <laughs> yes, if you have any comments on Halton Arp's contribution to quasar astronomy based on your microquasar studies. Oh, um, yeah, Halton Arp, I mean, he did amazing work 
And um, of course, uh, just the other day I was working on um, on an article that had you know some of his galaxies. But in uh, I personally did not for for my microquasar research, I focused on uh, only three or four targets really, and uh, I observed them in the radio and the X-ray. And I just analyzed that data and worked with um, international collaborations and we published that data. So I did not really tap into any of Halton Arp's research for any of that uh, because I think we were working on slightly different, different um, paths. Um, and someone is, has given you a suggestion. Um, maybe um, you could visit Perry and uh, write an article on what's going on there for the magazine. I would absolutely love to do that. I would love to do that. Um, I will have to exchange shifts with my co-editor uh, because I deal with the observing articles, like the strictly observing articles, and my co-editor does the uh, the sort of miscellaneous and history and so on. But I will make sure that one month we switch and I can come and do just that. <laughs> and so, you you showed the magazine at the start of your talk, but I'll just I'll just tell everybody who has their <laughs> back issues. Um, what you saw in this talk today is in this this article. It's a long article with lots of the same history that you heard today. So if uh, you missed anything, check out Diana's article. It is August 2020. Thank you. So here's another one for the VLA. Why don't they leave all the dishes on the tracks all the time so they can be more easily moved? It seems. Yeah. Um, That's a good question. Um, I think that was originally the idea, so I don't know why they bring that transporter in, but um, I am going to have to look that one up and try and remember to think about that for next time because I don't actually know that. It must could, have. Seen. Could it have something to do with the stability uh, if it's on the car on the versus trans, on right, the road? Probably. I don't know. And I, I, I should I should look that up. OK, each position has a spur. Right. I know also that they get. There's a yeah, there's a certain point where. Yeah, but they don't have to go in that direction then. OK, so whoever it was who said that they visited. That's right. OK, now, sorry, I'm getting so con so distracted now. I saw that uh, comment about the volcanism. Yes. August 2020 has that, but the but the September 2020 has the follow up article to the uh, cryovolcanism. <laughs> so uh, so you can get go to our store and get August and September 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Would the person if the person who visited the VLA because that is one place I have not been to and not by the tracks I've used their their data, but I have not actually been there to my great chagrin. Um, if you'd like to explain, OK. So we're getting okay, some so commentary now. Yes, excellent. <laughs> you can read them out, Tom. <laughs> okay, so Ken, who check. works who works at Perry, um, says VLA had pods for a couple of data cables, and then Jack says VLA antennae left on the track would have to be in a fixed order. They are independent so that each single dish can be brought into the barn separately for maintenance. That's what I've seen. Yes, I've seen I've seen images of that that they're that they're brought into a hangar, a barn, like you said. Yeah. So, if we don't have any more radio astronomy questions, we could transition into the other part. Sure. So let me let me ask this. Um, you should be able to see if, if you're attending that there's a little uh, somewhere on your screen, there's a little emoji with a hand and you can raise your hand. And I want to ask how many of us here subscribe to Sky and Telescope? <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. 10, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we're, it looks like we have in the neighborhood of maybe 36 no, people here. Astronomy Magazine does not count. <laughs> yeah, astronomy doesn't count, no. So we're up to 17. So more than half of us. Yeah, that was a, that was a, uh, a bad comment there, probably. <laughs> no, it made me it made me giggle. Okay. <laughs> so, um, that actually opens up what could be the f first question to ask. There's, um, for as long as I remember, since the '70s, a discussion among astronomy aficionados which magazine is better <laughs> <laughs> and there you know there's some people who just swear by sky and telescope and say that astronomy is for those are real astronomers reading that <laughs> and and vice versa all sorts of complaints one way or the other but one of the things that i've noticed over the years is that um contributors leak back and forth across the different magazines it may be not so much early on as they do now um i've, I've always tried to s stay out of the fight and say just subscribe to both exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly so what i mean from the offices of sky and tell what's what's your outlook on uh, astronomy as the competition um do you pay attention to them do you uh ignore them do you um see what they have and wish we would have had that article are you are you trying to scoop each other on stuff what's what's the competition uh, like i know well i've been with sky and telescope four and a half years now and i know that this rivalry with astronomy of course goes way back before before i even started and i know that there are some deep rooted <laughs> deep rooted little skirmishes between the two the whole time i'm not privy to the history of all of this but uh, i we do talk about astronomy because of course there's fierce competition for subscribers not everybody feels like they can subscribe to both um print is uh is a bit in trouble in general and uh, we love all of our subscribers and we absolutely uh we've been through shaky times as everybody knows with the bankruptcy of f and w media and um, we were really worried there for a while, but we were very grateful that the AAS stepped in so that we can continue doing the work that we love to bring our love of astronomy, your love of astronomy, you know, to, to, to the world. Uh, I personally don't pay too much attention to any rivalry between us and astronomy because I think we, we, we sort of fill separate niches and at least the way I see it. And um, how would you describe that? I, I I think that for my my sort of gut feeling is that with Sky and Telescope we we go deeper into the more demanding uh, observing features, the more demanding observing articles, in the sense that. Um, uh we don't we sort of we try to cover the observing aspect of our hobby as maybe a little bit more deeply but um uh i i i i must say that i think we are just so focused on bringing the best that we can to our readers that we don't spend too too much effort uh on on thinking about you know astronomy and uh there are some contributors that have as you said there has been some crossover with contributors to both so um yeah i i i i prefer to focus on what we do <laughs> uh robert has commented that he thinks Sky and Tell is usually more technically accurate. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank um, you. Say a little bit about the how the AAS has transformed um, things because 
you know, I remember looking back at really, really old issues. Uh, one of the, the sort of classic articles that came around twice a year was what happened at the AAS meeting. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is there's always been that connection um, in the magazine because um, they were covering it as news. Um, who would have thought so much later that um, the American Astronomical Society would essentially step in and save the magazine? Um, how has and I guess you were there for that transition, right? I was. So how has that changed? what um, the outlook of the magazine, maybe the management, are they in what level is the American Astronomical Society, which is really a research organization, at what level are they involved in maybe sculpting what happens at the magazine or supporting or promoting the magazine? Talk about what has happened there. I'm not sure everybody even realizes that this transition has happened. Yeah, this transition happened a couple of years ago. It what year are we in? 2022? Three years ago now. Goodness. Uh, it was it was pretty earth shattering when um, F and we yeah, I started in August 2017 and I think it was in spring. No, it was spring 2019 that F&W Media declared bankruptcy. So I'd only been there a year and a half. And but there were signs that F&W Media was cracking uh, ever since I I think two months after I arrived, they laid off the first person that was in our building. They weren't with Sky and Telescope, but they were with one of the other magazines of uh, F&W Media. And then a couple of months later, somebody else, and then a couple of months later, somebody else. So it was all, it was, it was a little bit unsettling considering that I had moved across country, the country to come up here and start working at, you know, I, I grew up reading Sky and Telescope. You know, my father was a subscriber, and so I had Sky and Telescope, you know, like I read Sky and Telescope before I could read, you know, I'd be leafing through all the pictures and everything. And and then the great thing is that universities, all university libraries have subscriptions to Sky and Telescope. And so um, uh, every month, you know, I'd, I'd go, I'd want at the beginning of the month, I'd go wander up to the desk and to the table where they had the latest issues and see, you know, what, what what's, what's in the latest issue of Sky and Tell? So, I've I've had it, I've carried it around with me a long time, and so it was it was kind of it was it was exhilarating to get the job, and then very disconcerting to sort of see everything fragment before my eyes, and so F and W Media went bankrupt, and then you guys might remember Rick Feinberg, he was editor in chief uh, in the 2000s, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, he had gone from editor in chief at Sky and Telescope to press officer of the AAS. And so he was the one who really had this sort of like genius idea that, hey, you know, Sky and Telescope is, is, is up for grabs. Why don't, why doesn't the AAS jump in? And this coincided with, um, I don't know exactly when the AAS had started thinking about this. I think it might be some time ago, but maybe it was just gelling. The AAS did, did, does want to, did want to, does want to get more involved with the amateur side of, of astronomy. In fact, they have astronomy, uh, they have amateur memberships. I don't know if you know about that, but uh, the AAS, you don't have to be affiliated with the university or anything. They have amateur memberships for um, the amateur community. And they're dedicating more and more material, more and more, um, uh, yeah, for, for the summer conferences, the summer AS conference, they're trying to gather more and more uh, uh, amateur content for that. And uh, so they've been interested for a while in making inroads into the amateur community as well. And so when F&W Media went bankrupt, they thought, okay, Rick Weinberg thought, okay, you guys want to do this, Sky Telescope is up for grabs, why don't we just bring the two together? And so from, from what I feel uh, on the floor, uh, on the editorial floor, uh, the AAS is, doesn't want to interfere with, um, uh, interfere is too strong a word, doesn't want to uh, really be involved with our day-to-day -day editorial decisions. Uh, they very much want us to get on with doing what we've always done. And so they're just there to sort of support us. And I personally am quite excited by uh, the um, expanding into the amateur community a little bit more. And I think that, you know, the dust still hasn't fully settled uh, at Sky and Telescope. It was so disruptive to be faced with the bankruptcy and and just to be just dropped like that. And 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 um, and, and so the dust hasn't fully settled. But I think we're slowly, 
you know, coming up to speed again. And I cannot wait to see more of a sort of dovetailing with the with the the AAS with the amateur community, not us. I tell we're fine, but with the um, uh, uh, the AAS getting more involved. The, does the AAS, um, because it's so connected to the professional community, are, are they nudging people your way to to provide um, information for stories, to write stories? Do, does that sort of expand your base of possible contributors? Uh, that would be in the purview of our science editor, Camille Carlisle, and she has been at this for more than 10 years and she already has uh, made right. good inroads into right. the scientific community. And so, so it may um, have made her job a little easier because now she has a big institution behind yes. her. <laughs> yes, but, so, uh, but there's no active sort of funneling of, of writers to, to, toward us because I think Camille knows, you know, where to go and pluck them from. Good. So, yeah. So tell us about your job. What does the observing editor do? I know that, that you, um, so just to hold up another magazine, <laughs> that you, this is last month's issue yes. that you always write the um, the, um, sky the part glass. about just the vis the visible sky that you see with your yes. eyes. Um, but what else do you do as observing editor? You have some great observing articles there, but you don't usually write them. They're written by somebody else. So you're coordinating all of that. I edit them, and uh, that's a lot of fun. So all the observing features I edit. All the going deeps, I edit the going deep. I edit the observing, the main observing article. And uh, yes, I write sky at a glance. But editing the observing features is a lot of fun. And that is, we we basically, as editors, we get a raw manuscript. We basically get the text. And, uh, you know, some contributors like to suggest um, uh, image uh, artwork. Uh, but for the most part, we just get the text and we have to construct the article from the text. And so what we do uh, when I get a manuscript, I read through it and I determine what finder charts we need. If any, or almost always we need finder charts. Uh, I, I look at all the data. And so for each of the objects, I construct a table with the coordinates and the magnitudes and uh, whatever else. Um, we might deem interesting for the reader. Um, so I work with the art illustrator to construct the charts. I generate a chart, a finder chart with all the objects for that specific article. And then I hand it to the art illustrator and the art illustrator is the one who makes it look beautiful. And but I provide him with the data and then um, I uh, fact check. We try to be assiduous with all of our fact checking and I will fact check everything that I possibly can. And um, and and so that involves, you know, if if the author has decided to cover object distances, you know, I'll I'll check all of those, and I'll check all, you know, if they supply me with data for the table, we'll check all the numbers for the um, uh, for, for 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 the data and so on, and um, and then I provide, you know, I I often hunt for the for the artwork. And then I work with the art director very closely and we look at, I mean, the art director herself, she does the final design, but we discuss, you know, do we need certain elements this way or that way? And so each observing feature does take quite a bit of time to sort of put together. And, and then it depends on our contributing editors. We have some contributing authors. Uh, they're all fantastic people and, and some just provide a little bit more material, some a little bit less, but it's a process. It's, there's a lot of back and forth with the author always, which is great. Uh, I, I really love the interaction with our incredibly talented observers who contribute their uh, writing to our magazine. And so that's, that's the, the observing feature each month. And then going, I do the same for going deep. And, um, and, you know, the fact checking is very similar to what I did in, in the professional life because, you know, I peer reviewed papers uh, for the various journals. I peer reviewed for uh, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, astronomy and astrophysics and so on. And, and so that, that's basically doing the same thing. It's just making sure that everything, things do slip by sometimes. I hate it, but, uh, but that happens. But, um, and then uh, recently uh, I, uh, we debuted in January 2021, the 
pro-am conjunction column and I write that every second month. And that is really lots of fun and I, I, I hope we get a bit more coverage. Once we get a few more editors um, and we're, we're not all like overworked to the bone, um, I very much want to look into a little bit more, you know, exploring a bit more that, that, that sort of professional uh, recreational sort of interface. And so I've been writing that since January 2021. Uh, that's every two months, though. And that involves a little bit of research. I try and get in touch with the, So what, what I've been focusing on until now, we might go in a different direction, but what I've been focusing on until now is, is I've been researching uh, professional groups that require amateur assistance for their projects because they uh, either, you know, they, they have limited access to telescopes, the mountaintop telescopes and all of that. And the amateur community is so talented and so um, with so much, such a wide variety of, of instruments and spread across the globe. So that's the thing, you know, it's like with radio astronomy, you can observe 24 hours a day with the amateur community spread across, across the globe. If we're following something, if professionals want to follow something like um, uh, uh, the outburst of a source. Uh, we don't have to wait, you know, we can we can invoke the whole amateur community all over the world and we can get continuous coverage of a specific outburst. And um, and so uh, so that's uh, that's 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 sort of part of what I do. And then there's all the behind the scenes stuff, you know, like preparing the circular star charts. And once upon a time we used to write Skywatch. We're not doing Skywatch at the moment. And um, that I hope we revive it at some point, but that's literally that is part of this sort of the, that was a casualty of the, the bankruptcy and then the transition to AAS and all of that. Um, we prefer it. We, we have limited resources and we know that the magazine is, is really what keeps us all together. And so we wanted to focus on that. But Skywatch is something that I'm uh, I'm sad that, that we're not doing, but I hope that we revive that. And so, yeah. So we so have a request, have a request. Um, for you to share your email. Can we type oh, yes. that in? Uh, can you type that in the chat? Of course I can. Um, and then I'll, I'll read you another question while you're doing that. Um, someone wants to know um, what's your lead time on these articles? How far ahead do you prepare an observing feature for any particular month? I'll tell you in one second. Let me make sure I wrote that correctly, Sky. Very easy. Diana at skytelescope.org, all one, all one word. We prepare, well, I sent out, at the start of the year, I send out a call for observing features for the following year. So now in January, I sent out a call to all our contributing editors and to some, um, authors as well who they're not contributing editors but they have written for us so in january 2022 i sent out a call for observing proposals for observing feature proposals for 2023 and so i try to plan january through december a year in advance but we only we start working on the articles about four months ahead of time so right now where are we? We are, you see, because in my head we're working on June, July. So we are, so we're in March, right? Yeah, March, April, May, June, July. Yeah, we work about four months ahead. Four months so ahead of the issue. If, if something uh, visually comes up that's a, a target of opportunity, like a comet or a supernova, um, the magazine's going to cover it. Does that, does the observing part of that just get integrated into the sort of fast breaking piece that gets slotted in or how do you how do you deal with observing for something that you can't plan a year ahead? Uh, though, yeah, uh, those in fact we don't in the observing feature section like the the actual observing articles we don't cover those topics but we have the website and on the website we will often uh, publish um, uh, 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 observing news as it happens and then that those bits will get incorporated into the news notes in the magazine but that comes out you know then four months later or three months later so it's very difficult for us with the magazine to keep track of uh, breaking news events but um, but we try to cover some things on our website 
Um, and someone has mentioned um, Sue French. She's a longtime uh, observing yeah. um, contributor, and is is she coming back? It was the question. No, no, she wanted to fully retire. Okay. She she'd been doing this for what twenty something years, and oh, she wrote so beautifully. Those were wonderful. I love, oh, I love her writing so much. Um, she said, you know, she'd had enough of having to go out into a cold field, a cold snowy field in the middle of like a January night, you know, to do something. She wanted to observe when, you know, in more comfortable uh, situations. She'd done that for 20 years. You know, she her dedication was supreme and she was amazing but she says you know what i love my observing but now i've got to do it for me and so we were all so sad to see her leave do, do you know about um there's a venture she's involved with i think she's more on her own terms um called the observer's challenge have you heard of this yes yes and uh, this is actually something that was originated by a fellow who used to live down the street from me uh, a North Carolina observer that he's hooked up with her and he's got far-flung observers around the globe sort of watching awesome. objects and, and yeah. filing reports about it. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, we, we're sad to see her go, but we all understood. Yeah. 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 But her writing is sublime and, you know, just, and she's, she's, uh, some of her, Columns were um, were uh, collated into a book, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, I think most of us have that book on our bookshelf. And the wonderful thing is that her pieces are timeless, so we can right. just dip into you know any month and just pick up one of her one of her sublime sublime pieces. So, what else do you want us to know about the um, the magazine as as amateurs? How can you know, well, I would. I would like to say a few things. I would like to say we love getting new writers. So if you're an observer and you enjoy observing and you enjoy writing up about your observations, uh, do, you know, and, and if you have an interest in, in trying your hand at, at writing an article, do so, you know, and submit your manuscript. And uh, we have all our guidelines on our homepage. And, um, uh, yeah, I think just on the home page at the bottom, there's there's guide guidelines for uh, submissions, and we're always looking for new authors, and and uh, and also if you have an interest in, uh, it doesn't. I mean, so I take care of the observing, so that's that's one thing. And if you want a little bit of advice, you know, on on how to go about it, just just drop me a line, and I'll try and guide you through it. But it's you know, get your telescope out, observe, write down your your notes, and then weave it into a story. We like to have a little bit of a story behind it. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be a sort of beginning, middle, and end story, of course, but, you know, it's it's not just, uh, it's not just um, uh, uh, putting your observing notes, you know, into, into a Word doc. It's like, it has to be sort of like um, made, made into a, a more coherent sort of uh, 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 narrative, but we're 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 looking. We're always looking for for authors, new authors, and new ideas, and new outlooks. So if you're an observer and you'd like to try your hand at writing an article, please go ahead. But you don't have to be. In, you don't have to. You know. You don't have to do just that. If if you have. You know. We've had a couple of. Um, so my co-editor, um, who used to be an editor at Sky and Telescope before, then he went to the Canadian Sky News, and he's back now. So Gary Saronic. Most of you, if you're longtime readers of the magazine, you'll know he, he used to write binocular highlight mm -hmm. uh, before he left for Canada. And now he's back. Well, he's back at the magazine. He's still in Canada. But uh, so Gary, he uh, he handles the sort of uh, the miscellaneous, the history, the biographical, the um, the sort of non-observing features of the sort of observing department. And so if you have if you have an interest in uh, in the if you have an interest and not just interest, but if you have that uh, solid background in some maybe historical aspect of astronomy, if, if you've written articles or if you if you if you're if you're affiliated with a, a planetarium or a college a historical observatory or something, you know, just go ahead, uh, submit, write, submit. Because that's one thing for sure. That's one thing I could tell you about the magazine. We, we, we do love getting new new authors. Okay. Um, someone has asked um, if you have journalism experience before coming here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
No, not journalism. In fact, it's on my list to go and do a um, a sort of crash course in journalism. But I do. I've written peer, uh, journal articles. I know it's very different. But I have uh, to for, when I was in research, I wrote up uh, um, you know journal papers, of course for uh, for for the various journals, you know AppJ and MNRAS and so on. Um, so I've done a lot of writing in that sense. But uh, but I was very involved with my club in Florida, and uh, so with my club in Florida, I I joined them on a lot of outreach stuff. I wrote the newsletter for the club in Florida and so Which on. Which club? The Palm Beach Astronomical Society. Astronomical Society of the Palm Beaches, I should say. That's their real name. <laughs> and but no, uh, I don't. But I. Um, when I arrived at Sky and Telescope, I uh, discussed with I had I, I had a sit down with the other editors and and um, and uh, some of them gave me you know some of their tips and so on. But uh, but I had done the observing side, been involved in the observing side, been involved in the club side. But yeah, I'd had a full career before Sky and Telescope in um, in research. And I went straight from PhD to postdoc to uh, to um, to a research institute. Were you just driven to to uh, get out of the research world and into the the observing world? I mean, what 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 led you to where you are now? There were quite a few. Yes, life events that happened along the way. Um, one of them was we were living, my husband and I were living in Europe at the time when I was still in research and um, uh, we needed to move back to the US to for personal reasons and we did so and you know I was still involved with research for a while but it was getting it was getting thornier and 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 I'd been working in Finland for a while. It's a very small astronomical community there. I think currently there are only three astronomy institutes. You know, there were four when I was there. There's the University of Helsinki. There's the department. There was the department at the University of Turku. Then there was Metsähovi Radio Observatory that was affiliated with Helsinki University of Technology. So I was with the University of Helsinki first, and then uh, University of Technology. And then there used to be a department up at the University of Oulu in the north, but that uh, that got disbanded at some point. So the astronomical community in Finland was very small, you know, the sort of and um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I tired of all the the fighting for the small pot of money and the mm -hmm. you know the constant uh, sort of rivalries and everything. And I was like, oh, I just want to do my astronomy, and. When I was at the University of Edinburgh, I, for my undergraduate, there really were two things that interested. Sorry, the cat's finally getting his kibble, okay, because he was crying here. Um, uh, I, I had been fascinated in in science communication and science, you know, journalism with science communication from a very early age, and I had always wanted to get involved in science writing at some point. And I think when I was at Edinburgh, it was it could have gone either way. And in fact. One other person at in my class, she went on to write for goodness. I don't remember now. Um, she might have been freelance because I saw her pay her articles in, in quite a few of the sort of uh, science magazines, mm. international science magazines. But so I was I was like, I could have I would have loved to have gone into science communication as well. But uh, research kind of had the pull on me. And uh, that's why I ended up going into research research. So when when the moment came to sort of think about, okay, what to do next, I thought, uh, okay, let's see if 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 I could go back to that other love of mine, you know, science communication and and um, and 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 outreach, and and uh, it, it all happened at the same time. There was this job going at Sky and Telescope, and I applied, and I can't believe how 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 lucky I was, and I'm super grateful for having been offered that job, because it's 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 very it's very viscerally satisfying to be so connected to the night sky again, because of course, when you observe in the radio and the X-ray, X-ray, you've got your detectors in orbit around you. You, you don't touch your instrument, you know. You just wait for your data to dribble through the the computer, and uh, so with radio telescopes, you can get a bit up close, but you're not pushing any buttons. <laughs> so. Um, you, the, the telescope operators do not let us push the buttons. 
<laughs> so, uh, so it's it's wonderful to be back at that, you know, that connection with that. Yes, you know, I I I, I control my telescope, sort of thing, and and the community is so wonderful. The the amateur community is just so. Uh, th there's that passion that I think a lot of professional astronomers lose at some point because it is a, a, a you know, you, you're just there, you get your data, you analyze it, you publish, you go to conferences, you meet great people and, and you're doing great, you, you're learning about great stuff and you're making great discoveries and so on. But it's it can be quite brutal. And uh, so it's wonderful to, and so professionals, I myself, we lose that sense of wonder at some point. But uh, I think the amateur community just holds on to it. And it's just wonderful to be back. You know, it, it reminded me why I first looked up when I was like five years old. <laughs> wow. Well, your enthusiasm for what you do surely shows. And uh, so we're happy that you um, agreed to, to share it with us. And I hope you're, you're doing this all around the country and visiting with other groups and connecting with um, the, these like-minded people who, who just enjoy looking at the sky. So thanks so much for um, for joining us today and, and sharing us the history of radio astronomy and a little glimpse into what you do at Sky and Tell. Um, it looks like we don't have any other questions and so it's a good point here I think to end the session. Uh, we'll be back at three o'clock for our last session. Uh, Britt Lundgren will be talking about galaxy evolution. Um, be aware that the imaging, uh, astro imaging contest is still going on, but uh, the voting will close soon. So if you haven't um, hit the link for that, um, I think I put one up early in the chat. Um, go over and vote for your favorite images. So thanks again, Diana. Thank you, everybody. I hope to come down one day and meet you all in person. I'd absolutely love that. And yeah. everybody write to me if you have questions or just want to connect or anything, okay? Thank okay. you so much for this opportunity, Tom. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.